righty, ready for the word. I'd like to continue our series on developing a biblical worldview with part two of the message on walking in truth in a world of lies. Walking in truth in a world of lies. Now, if you weren't here last week, that's fine. Where were you? But uh, we took our text from John's third epistle, verses three and four. For I was very glad when some brothers came and testified to your faithfulness to the truth, how you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And we show that walking here is, a, is an idiom, a, a metaphor, not just for physical walking, but it actually refers to a way of life. The Christian life is not Saturday night or Sunday morning. It's, it's, it's 24 seven. And walking in here means that there's a consistent, constant uh, awareness of walking in living and thinking in the truth. And the greatest challenge to the church today is to walk in truth in the midst of a culture increasingly given over to lies. And what we're witnessing today reminds us of the backslidden condition of the nation of Israel during the ministry of the prophet Jeremiah. When God spoke, you live in a world of deception. In their deception, they refuse to know me. The NLT version says they pile lie upon lie and utterly refuse to acknowledge me. And the New King James says your dwelling place is in the midst of deceit. Uh, tonight I want to talk about the world of lies that we live in created by the politicians and a complicit press and how the Christian can overcome. So. I'm going to resume again because this is obviously a political season with the big election coming up Tuesday and the lying in the political realm is not a new thing. The old joke is how do you know if a politician is lying? The answer is their lips are moving. But uh, it's nothing new. Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, said in uh, 1940, Nationally, I have said this before, but I'll say it again and again and again. Your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. Uh, within a year and a half, we were in World War II. Lyndon B. Johnson said, we're not about to send American boys nine or 10,000 miles away from home to do what Asian boys ought to be doing themselves. A year later, we were in the Vietnam War. Uh, Colin Powell, who was Secretary of State during the escalation in the, in the East, in the Mideast, said, let me share with you what we know from eyewitness accounts. We have firsthand descriptions of biological weapons factories on wheels and on rails. Well, we never did find those weapons. That turned out to be untrue. Barack Obama when he was working to pass Obamacare, said, if you like your health plan, you can keep it. If you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. That particular one won the Tampa Bay Times Lie of the Year Award in 2013. <laughs> American Christians have lived through many lies, but what's happening today makes, takes lying to an all new level. As Steve Gallagher points out in his book, which I'm recommending, his book's the title of the message tonight, Living in Truth in a World of Lies, said, while it is true that deception has been part of our political system from its earliest days, none of it can compare to the level of falsehood being propagated by our government today. In fact, it's gotten so bad, we now have a new term to define it, post-truth politics. How many of you know that, that dictionaries always are updating? But there are new words that are added to the dictionary every year. 
Well, this one is post-truth politics. Wikipedia says post-truth politics is a political culture in which debate is framed largely by appeals to emotion disconnected from the details of the policy and by the repeated assertion of talking points to which factual rebuttals are ignored. Now, I was born in 1944, so I have lived under 15 different U.S. presidents. All of them lied. But our president is Pinocchio in the flesh. On the first of this month, he told the world, inflation is a worldwide problem right now because of the war in Iraq. Uh, Excuse me the war in Ukraine. I'm thinking of Iraq because that's where my son died. Well, Biden's son did not die in Iraq. Biden's son served in Iraq, but he died of brain cancer in a hospital in Bethesda, Maryland. He's continued to state that his son died in Iraq at least 15 times publicly. I think he really does has come to believe that his son did die in Iraq. He said, let me point out about being a big spending Democrat. I spent a lot of money doing the things I've done, but guess what? Guess what? I cut the deficit in half, in half. This year alone, a $1 trillion, $400 reduction. Now, friends, that is an outright lie. Our national debt last year was $29.6 trillion. Currently, as he says those words, it's $30.8 trillion. So do the math. But it's even worse. One website just released this report. In just 20 months, President Biden has added $4.8 trillion to our 10-year deficits. In the same speech, Biden said the economy, in fact, is growing. News to me, the fact, in fact, the economy grew 2.6% last quarter, and though it may not feel that way, people's incomes went up last quarter more than inflation. Economic growth is up. Price inflation is down, real incomes are up, gas prices are down. His nose is out to here by now. None of those statements, not one of them, is true. None of it. He said, how many of you know someone who needs insulin? Do you know how much it costs to make insulin for diabetics? Well... It was invented by a man who didn't patent it because he wanted the drug to be available to everyone. I spoke to him, okay? Well, the problem with that is the man who invented insulin died a year before Joe Biden was born. So unless he had a seance and was talking to a dead man, that is untrue. In the same speech, he claimed he went to Delaware State University, but that's an all-black college. Biden actually went to the University of Delaware. Biden embarrassed himself last week trying to take personal credit for the cost of living increase in Social Security checks, which will begin for seniors in January of next year. In this tweet from the White House, Seniors are getting the biggest increase in their Social Security checks in 10 years through President Biden's leadership. They had to delete that tweet within one day because the fact check is President Biden has nothing to do with this raise. Seniors will receive the large benefit increase due to the annual cost of living adjustment based on the inflation rate, something President Nixon signed into law in 1972. It's an automatic benefit tied to the consumer price index. Has nothing to do with Biden's leadership. President Joe Biden has become totally untethered from the truth. And I'm calling him out on this. 
Last week, citing the attack on Paul Pelosi, he accused the opposing party of condoning violence against political opponents. This is a campaign event. He says, this guy purchases a hammer to kneecap the number three in line to be president of the United States of America, or number two in line. Well, actually, she is number three in line. He's not sure. I should say to the United, to be the United President of the United States of America, I'm quoting directly, and nobody from the other party condemns it for exactly what it is. Says it's not because when I made a comment about this, it's to be expected when you have leaders from the other party condoning that kind of conduct. That's an outright lie. The truth is that not one person from the other party condoned the attack on Mr. Pelosi. Quite the contrary. Dozens of leaders from the other side said this is unacceptable behavior. The Daily Signal, November 4th, says President Biden has not to this day spoken out to condemn the attempted assassination in June of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. So while he accuses the other side of condoning violence and not speaking up against it, he himself has never had anything to say about the planned assassination of one of our Supreme Court justices. In a speech last week, Biden accused the 80 million Americans who voted for Donald Trump of promoting voter suppression. Quote, MAGA Republicans support voter suppression. Well, I voted for Trump and I did not support voter suppression, nor do I. They're trying to succeed where they failed in 2020 to suppress the right of voters and subvert the electoral system itself. That means dumping your right to vote and deciding whether your vote even counts. Instead of waiting until an election is over, they're starting well before it. They're starting now. They've emboldened violence and intimidation of voters and election officials. But friends, the truth is there's no voter suppression. Daily Signal reports that in the Georgia primary, there's a 168% overall increase in turnout already over 2018. A national Gallup poll released Wednesday shows that 41% of Americans have already voted or plan to vote early compared to just 34% in 2018. Under the present administration, which controls the White House and both houses of Congress, gas prices are up, grocery prices are up, Illegal immigration is up, and street crime is up. Inflation is killing us. Last week, I went to Costco for my tire rotation. I believe in rotating the tires, and I knew they were getting old, but they, they wouldn't even rotate them. They said, no, nah, these tires, you got to replace them. I said, okay, give me the similar Michelin's. Well, <laughs> the last time I put tires on my car was $900. Last week, they told me it's now $1,400. So I hope none of you need tires. And, of course, the guy was very apologetic. He said, well, what can we do? He says, you know, it's an oil-based uh, product. I mean, that's how they make it. And it's up more than most things. But from $900 to $1,400 $1, in three years? But instead of taking responsibility and offering solutions, the president is trying to tell us we should be thankful. We don't have it as bad as other countries. He claimed, claiming U.S. inflation is the lowest in the world. He said last week, we have the lowest inflation rate of almost any country in the world. We've done a lot to take it under control. I've released millions of barrels of oil from our strategic petroleum reserve, keeping the price down. That statement contains two breathtaking lies. First, since he's done the release of our oil reserves, which never explains what's going to happen if we really have an emergency, 
Oil prices have actually gone up 6%. So we're poorer in our oil reserves by half, but the oil prices have gone up 6%. And secondly, America does not have the lowest inflation rate. By the way, it's 8.2%. His speech will come as a surprise to nations with lower inflation rates. China. 2.8, Japan, 3%, Saudi Arabia, 3.3, Switzerland, 3.3, South Korea, 5.75, Indonesia, 5.7, France, 6.2, Canada, Brazil, Australia, Australia, Spain, India, Singapore, South Africa, all have lower inflation rates than we do. Now, I don't want to demean the man who sits in the Oval Office for his lapses of memory or slurring his words or honest mistakes. But I do demean the lying and the way so many people put up with it. The outcry should be thundering, but there's almost nothing A few outlets here and there, yes, but by and large, Steve Gallagher says, we expect politicians to exaggerate, yes, but what does it say about our nation when we accept downright lies as if the truth no longer matters? One may well wonder why there's no outcry when our leaders lie like this. President Biden, a couple of weeks ago, our economy is strong as hell. Vice President Kamala Harris, our border is secure. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. Friends, in days gone by, lying political powers were held in check by the pastors in our pulpits and the power of a free press. But in our day, 90% of the pulpits in America, according to Barna, will not preach on politics at all. And the press has become the puppet of the party in power. This has happened before. I'm going to give you a brief history lesson. I'm expanding now. I hope you know I'm I'm moving from, from the world of the lying leaders in politics to the media. History tells us that an evil state led by lying leaders cannot continue without a complicit media press corps. You know, I I like history. I'm not a, I'm not as up on it as even some of you, but the truth is I do think history has a lot to teach us. And all you have to do is look at the countries who have come under totalitarianism, communism, socialism, countries where you have lying leaders, and you will discover they always take over the press. Vladimir Lenin was the first president of the Soviet Union from 1917 to 1924. He seized the press, which he used to control the people through propaganda. Now, if you come here, you know we've talked about this before, but it is good to define what the term. Propaganda is information especially of a biased or misleading nature used to promote or publicize a particular political cause or point of view. Propaganda is the information, the false information, the lies that the totalitarian governments pipeline through the mass medias that that they control. Lenin said this, the press should not only be not only a collective propagandist 
and a collective agitator, but also a collective organizer of the masses. He said, we can and must write in a language which sows among the masses hate, revulsion, and scorn toward those who disagree with us. And these are words that came from a man who in five years of his rule murdered five million Russians who disagreed with him. After Lenin came Joseph Stalin who led the Soviet Union from 1924 till his death in 1953, during which time he murdered over 20 million Russian citizens. Stalin said the press must grow day and night. It is our party's sharpest and strongest weapon. So there you have Lenin and Stalin, but none used the power of the press more masterfully than Joseph Goebbels, Adolf Hitler's minister of propaganda, who made the press his puppet for manipulating the German people. Goebbels said, Think of the press as a great keyboard on which the government can play. You see, under evil rulers, they're not reporting the news. They're following orders. Goebbels said, uh, and you wonder why you don't hear some stories that need to be reported. Well, he said, not every item of news should be published. Rather, those who control news policies must endeavor to make every item of news serve a certain purpose. He said, it's the absolute right of the state to supervise the formation of public opinion. Friends, all of these things are in play today, right here in America. And if you if you think they think we're stupid, you are right. He said the rank and file, meaning the common people, the rank and file are usually much more primitive than we imagine. Propaganda must therefore always be essentially simple and repetitious. I don't know about you, but I believe we're living in a world of lies, not just from the politics, but from the press. The press is everywhere. It's newspapers, it's magazines, it's television, it's mainstream media. The late Canadian journalist Gil Cortemont said, propaganda is as powerful as heroin. It surreptitiously dissolves all capacity to think. That's a very profound insight, beloved, because if we allow lies to flood our minds, you do come to a place where you can't think straight. This is why those who watch the mainstream media lose their minds and lose all capacity to recognize good and evil. George Orwell said political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder sound respectable. And this is what's going on today with the abortion issue. You know, I had a whole section I left out about the way that language is being manipulated to lie to us. Not just by the politicians like the Inflation Reduction Act, which does nothing to reduce inflation, and when it comes to abortion, now they want to call it a woman's reproductive rights. I guess killing babies is too strong. We're protecting a woman's reproductive rights. Friends, abortion has nothing to do with a woman's right to reproduce. Actually, she's already made her choice to reproduce when she had sex. Excuse me, I'm just a little... Lizzie's not here, so I'm not afraid of anything. <laughs> Reproductive rights. That's just a lie. That's right. And then they have half-truths, 
like Black Lives Matter. Well, of course, Black Lives Matter. But Black Lives Matter doesn't mean Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is a communist organization designed to sow discord between the races. Lying leaders have always needed a complicit press. And history is repeating itself today with the modern American Marxists who are using the mainstream media to control how people think. Glenn Beck cried out a while back, the corruption of our media tells us to deny our own eyes. There's a car on fire behind you, and they say, nothing to see here. There's a car on fire behind you, and we're not supposed to notice. They tell us, don't believe your own eyes. Believe us. It's incredible when you, when you can find the true footage of what's going on. Even today, I saw what's been happening at the southern border in the last 24 hours. Hundreds and hundreds of illegal aliens just coming into the country, not being opposed, blocked, questioned on either side of the border. They're just streaming in. And they got their flip-flops and their knapsacks and... They're just coming in. And they don't mind being arrested because they know they're going to get free meals, a cell phone, a nice place to stay, and health benefits, which is way more than they're getting where they came from. And I don't mean to not be compassionate. I care about people that are being hurt. If, so, if only somebody would tell them what you're doing, though, is the very evil governments that you're seeking to escape from are coming to America unless we vote right. This reminds me of, uh, uh, quote, the British novelist George Orwell again. This is from his uh, famous book, 1984, which was a novel about what society would look like under a big brother totalitarian government and he said the party meaning the government the party told you to reject all evidence of your eyes and ears it was their final most essential command and that is exactly what's going on today in the dreams of those who want to change america into a socialist nation they actually were, you know, the border's secure. It's fine. But look at the evidence. Don't, don't, don't worry. The border is secure. I'm telling you, believe me. Don't believe your lying eyes. Our country is strong as hell. Our economy is strong as hell, our president says. But, but look what I just paid for tires. Look what I just paid for gas. Look what I just spent at Kroger. I mean, what about all this? The economy's strong. Don't believe that. Isn't this exactly what is going on today? Nothing to see here. Now, let me give you some good news. Because I believe God's in charge of everything that's happening. The good and the bad. Our God is good. And he is wiser than all the rest of us put together. And the good news is that God is waking Americans up. The ratings of the fake news mainstream media outlets have hit all-time lows. That's a fact. Dominic Mastrangelo, writing for The Hill... A New York Times Siena College poll just found that 59% of voters view the media as a major threat to democracy. While 25% said the press is a minor th threat and only 16% said it poses no threat. If you put all that together, eight out of 10 Americans now see the media as some kind of threat to our nation, to our democracy. He says an annual Gallup survey also published this week found only 34% of Americans believe major news organizations will report fully, accurately, and fairly 
on current events. So Americans are waking up to the fact they're being lied to. And I suppose that's probably the first step out of deception is to understand that you're being deceived. Because people that are deceived don't know they're deceived or they wouldn't be deceived. But when you begin to realize that you, there has been deception, then there's, there's a way out. And as far as the threat to democracy, we're being told that by the party in power that if the other party goes well in the election, does well in the election, that, that, that we will be a threat to democracy. Because democracy is on the ballot. By the way, they all talk to each other. Have you noticed? I, I watched, uh, I didn't put it down, I could have, I could, but I saw all, there was at least a dozen different news outlets and internet news publications that said the same thing. Democracy is on the ballot. And they're warning us, you better vote for us, keep us in power because democracy is on the ballot. Well, I voted Thursday and I looked at the ballot. I didn't see democracy on the ballot. I saw some names. I mean, this is how stupid they think we are. Millions get their news from social media platforms, which have for years been controlled by the far left loons. But maybe you haven't noticed that is changing. Donald Trump launched Truth Social. Elon Musk bought Twitter. And it's reported Kanye West is acquiring Parler. And all of these men have stated they're going to restore freedom of speech to these platforms. And the far left loons are going loony over that because it threatens their agenda. I mean, this is all good news. The awakening is underway. And let me give you the best news of all. The greatest hope I have and the greatest hope God's people ought to have. Lies never last. Political governments and politicians who live on lies always fall. Always. They gain power by lying, but they lose power when the lies are exposed by the truth. Now follow me on this. It's very important. I go back to Goebbels. Even he knew this. He said, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. Okay, this is the important part. But the lie can be maintained only for such times as the state can shield the people from the political, economic, and or military consequences of the lie. I don't want to go too fast over that because that's very important. He said, we can tell a big lie and people, if we keep repeating it and repeating it, whether it's climate change or abortion is a, is a good thing, it, if they keep repeating it, people begin to believe it. But they only can believe it as long as the government can shield them from the truth. And that always comes out in the consequences of the lie. And this is what we're living in today. The big lie in, in 2020 was, if you elect me as president, I will unite the country. I'll be a united. I know how to bring people together. That was, how many of you know, he said that over and over and over and over. And people believed it. 80 million people believed it. Well, now we know that was a lie. We were more divided than we've ever been. That's why eventually, Lies, when they're exposed, uh, those who did the lying will fall. These people lied their way into power and maintain their power by a puppet press corps that shields them, but it, don't, it won't last. Goebbel says, it thus become, here's his solution. Here's how the state needs to keep the lie going. He said, it thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all its powers to repress dissent. 
For the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie. And thus, by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Now, if you don't hear anything else tonight, and I know this is, many of this is not happy news, much of it, but the, very, the truth is even they know. If you have an evil state or evil leaders, they know their greatest enemy is not the other political party. It's not even the Christians. It's the truth. The truth is the greatest enemy of the state. That's one of the most startling statements I've ever read coming from an evil ruler. An admission that his power that was built on lies could be brought down by truth. In his book, Letter to the American Church, Eric Metaxas reminds us this was how President Reagan brought down the Soviet Union without firing a shot. Some of, most of you are old enough to remember when the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union was, was fragmented. Metaxas says, Ronald Reagan seemed to know that because the Soviet Union was built on a lie, it was unsustainable and could be brought down if someone had the courage to stand and fight against it. Reagan knew that the Soviet Union presented itself, as all bullies and monsters and devils do, as something more powerful than it was. He knew that what its leaders desperately feared was that someone like himself would call their bluff. And he knew that most of the people around him had been perfectly content not to call that bluff but to be bluffed. That's a powerful thing. And if you study that era when that all happened, that's exactly what it was. It took a strong leader who would speak the truth. And the truth alone, the truth being spoken in courage, is what did the trick. John Ross turned me on to a book by Australian uh, writer Kay Rubicek. It's called Nowhere Else to Run, 10 Steps to Survive Tyranny Today. Thank you, John. The book is uh, about she interviewed 100 people who survived under evil rulers, communist, socialist, totalitarian systems. And I want to give you some amazing words of wisdom addressed to all of us who love the Lord and are grieved with the current condition of our country to encourage any of you who may be downcast, discouraged, or depressed. Rubicek says, we must remember and we must remind each other that tyranny is vulnerable, very vulnerable. Whether it's labeled Marxist, Leninist, communist, socialist, fascist, transhumanist, globalist, monopolist, or any other form of tyranny, it relies on its core tactics of lies, deceit, hatred, and violence. This makes it vulnerable to truth, that it is desperately afraid of any glimmer of hope between its targets when they have the courage to maintain faith in truth over lies. And this is where we need to be, walking in truth. In everything we think, everything we do, everything we say, all of our moral ethical judgments need to be through the biblical worldview that we find in the Word of God. That God has not uh, allowed us knowledge of uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He still forbids that. God expects His people, which is you and me, to look to him for the truth about every issue, whether it's abortion or homosexuality or politics, God's word has something to say about everything, every, every subject. And we just need to live in the truth, walk in the truth. And that, if we do that and have the courage to maintain faith in truth over lies, we will see God prevail. 
Don't fear them. Friends, the truth is they fear us. We are well able to walk in the light in a world of lies because we have Christ. He is the light of the world, and he called us the light of the world in his famous Sermon on the Mount. And I'll close with this thought. This is a part of a scripture, part of a verse that always has meant a lot to me, and I think when you think about it, it's the greatest thing we could know in this hour. It's from the first chapter of John's Gospel, verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Where there's darkness, where there's lies, where there's deceit, deception, where there's evil, the light of the truth, when it shines, the darkness cannot overcome it. It can't stop it. You know, it's like when you walk into a dark room, and you say, well, it's so dark in here. What can I do about this darkness? It's all around me. I can't see. The solution is very simple. Turn on the light. Light comes, darkness goes. And that is what you and I can do every place we go, in our marriage, in our homes, in our schools, in our jobs. Wherever we go, we can shine that light. We can be that light. And in the voting booth, we can be that light. And I'm telling you, it still works. That's a principle that always wins. And that's why I'm not afraid. I love that song we sang tonight, I am not afraid. Show me your glory, Lord. I am not afraid. And I, I, I can't be afraid. Because when I consider the enemies of the truth and realize that we have the truth, they're nothing. You say, but they're in power. It's temporary. It's always temporary. God help us to know that. When we shine, when we walk in the truth, lies lose their power. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for the tests of trials of this hour because I believe you are exposing liars and lying and this world of lies we live in. And I pray for every Christian who is depressed or discouraged, a downcast because of the current events and the situation that's everywhere in our nation, in the halls of power, on our television sets, everything that seems to overwhelm us. I thank you, God, that you are showing us that there is a power greater than all of that. And when we walk in the truth in a world of lies, we always have the victory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Everybody all right? Okay. Nobody mad? Gee, nobody walked out. Why don't you stand to your feet? I don't know about you, but this would be a very good time to be fasting and praying uh, for our nation. How many of you have already voted? Good. God bless you. Please vote. One of the disgraces of the past few years has been the fact that ha only half the Christians vote. And if we ever... Uh, can see the fruit of that we see it now we're living with that and so not only go vote but influence everyone that you can In influence everyone that you can to go and vote i want to tell you when i went through that boat vote and boom and pull all those levers and walked out and they put that little sticker on says i voted i just felt like i made my day so get out and vote get other people to get out and vote and be praying because truly this is, and I will say this, I believe I'm very optimistic about the results that will come, but even if they don't, our God reigns. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. We love you so much.